Yeah, we're all right this time. to Windows on the World. This is part two of our broadcast, The Last Revolution, and we've caught up with Piers Corbyn, somebody who's no stranger to this show, and he's going to share with us some of his insights, because it's the end of the year, and this is a follow-on to the first part of our show, which was also the last show of the year, and we're going to be talking about quite a few things. So, Piers, are you there? I am. Excellent. So, first part of the show, yeah, first part of the show, we were talking about this latest idea of a revolution and where it came from and where it's going. So, in this part of the show, could you kind of give us your insights into what you've seen and what you think's going on politically, especially with the Yellow Vests? Right, yes. Well, it was very interesting stuff because the yellow vest sort of came, well, out of the blue, so to speak. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, any political or social revolution needs to have uh, effective leadership who can organise and make clear demands. The yellow vests don't have that as such, but it is developing. So it's an interesting proposition as to whether there could actually be a revolution in France and Europe. I, I don't think it would turn into an actual revolution, but there's certainly going to be huge upheavals, and they will carry on. And um, just for the sake of history, our listeners might like to know that uh, historically in the last 100 or 150 years, revolutions have happened in odd-numbered years, and failed revolutions have been in even-numbered years. 2019, of course, is an odd number. So, uh, might be something to look forward to. Um, I, I think that whatever 2019 will be a very important year of dramatic change in politics and in science in um, uh, the United Kingdom and in Europe. And the science part, of course, is because of the centrality of the climate change fake news which is used, as we pointed out in shows before, by the Wall Street globalists to uh, corral people into uh, what they want. And, of course, the uh, Agenda 21 climate change sustainability nonsense, uh, fake, uh, fake science and fake news, um, was the first issue which the Yellow Vest complained about because it was leading to these hikes in um, petrol prices, which uh, is a very big issue in France, especially in the countryside where, um, uh, you know, transport by cars is, is very important. So uh, that, of course, though, then has a bearing on Brexit and so on and the, the general role of the European Union, because the European Union is very much a driver of the climate change narrative, because that is used, uh, as we mentioned in our meeting on the 20th of December, and there's videos on this online. Uh, the climate change narrative has been used to de-industrialise Britain and, and other parts of Europe, um, but largely not Germany, but definitely de-industrialising Britain, supposedly to save the planet by moving industry to India, where it produces as much CO2 as it did in Britain, uh, but this was explicitly driven by the European Union, and the same policies, of course, uh, lead to increased fuel prices, and when people are hard up, that's just going to be a big issue. Well, I think my point about it in the first part of the show was that, in actual fact, 
it's not about having leaders it's about having an objective a common aim and that was what's was quite yes. interesting to me about okay. the whole thing yeah yes no i understand that um although these demands have to be voiced at some point but but you're, you're right if there's a clear common objective however that is arrived at then uh there will be very dramatic change um like happened in the poll tax there was a clear very clear objective i.e get rid of it um i wouldn't say there were specific well-known leaders in the poll tax events against mrs thatcher but there was a, as you said a common objective uh, it didn't result in a a revolution in Britain, but it, it, it had a very big impact on politics in the subsequent uh, subsequent ten years. Um, now, the big thing on the plate for us now is, of course, Brexit, and whether or not the globalists, the Wall Street globalists, the corporate globalists, are going to get away with preventing it. Now, I think they won't get away with preventing it, although they're trying everything they can and trying to force Parliament into a choice between no deal, which they're billing as falling off a precipice, and uh, the Theresa May's deal, which is, of course, actually imprisonment in the EU and worse than... Uh, well, it's the worst of all worlds. It's a completely insane thing to go for. Um, but I've noticed in speaking to the public and on various outlets, the... Um, acceptance of no deal is actually gaining a lot of ground and uh it was an interesting guy from a british fellow working in a, for an american newspaper who was on george galloway's show and he pointed out that the uh, the no deal brexit um alarmism and fear is just completely unfounded that most of the so-called problems can be solved by single statements from the relevant ministers in britain that's well, this exactly is it. What the the papers and the, the news media just run away with this stuff. There's been a stupid scare story about it every day, and most of them are getting pretty comedic by now. But basically, yeah. the public have just been hoodwinked with whatever can be thrown at them, and it's just been relentless. So when things are relentless, they stop having an effect, and that's why, in a way, I've stop, I've kind of turned off from a lot of that now. Yeah, yeah. No, I can understand that. So the question will be on the 29th of March. Well, on the, the 14th of January, they're meant to have some decision or other in Parliament. Now, my guess is that she'll fund something again, or they'll pass something which might be... Uh, well, I don't know what it will be, but, but you know, that they don't want to be seen to be defeated. Um, they'll try and come up with something. However, the no deal Brexit has now got um, over 280,000 signatures. So there's got to be a debate specifically in Parliament on that, because that's, that's what the rules say. You get over 100,000, there's got to be a discussion in Parliament. Um, that number of signatures is, I think, a record for any petition that's gone to the British Parliament. Um, so I, I would say that if authorities try and go ahead with preventing Brexit on the 29th of March that there will be sort of yellow vest style action around the country. I mean, I, I can't see people lying down and taking it. I know if you're in the London bubble you it's difficult to imagine this, but you see when you travel around uh, most parts of Britain, especially the north, the, the you know anger at what is going on is, is, uh, is clear and there will be uh, action of all sorts uh, if they try and get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. So I just got someone saying they couldn't hear what we were doing, but I think it's because they need to refresh the page. We are live. So, yeah, very interesting stuff we've been covering in the first part of the show, and I hope it was very informative, just given the background, really, of revolution and what's happening, because the narrative is being controlled so much and language has been stripped of its meaning. So we're in the post-truth world where, you know, we have a very restricted kind of language and bringing language back and actually objectives that make people sharpen up what they're actually talking about is extraordinarily important. That was one of the points I was making in the latter part of the show Absolutely, was that yeah. um, there are ways around things with words 
Words are the most powerful yes. thing, and words are what are being used against us, the slander, the stupidity, and all of that is wearing a little bit thin, which is why I'm finding that very interesting at the moment. Yeah, we've been doing some talks all over the country, and please do get in touch with us if you want us to speak. We speak to small groups all over the place, some of them quite large groups, and we're getting a lot of interaction. The shows are called The Bigger Picture. They feature myself, Piers Corbin and Sandy Adams. We cover the big picture. In other words, what's behind what's going on, who's doing it and why, and what the intended outcome is. And once you know the intended outcome, then you can act more accordingly. More accordingly, within the law and looking at it. I was having a conversation earlier on today, and this this big thing about the you know breaking the law, this this extinction rebellion thing. Well, if you're going to break the law in such a dreary way, is there any point in breaking the law? You know, you might as well do something more interesting that's lawful. Um, I think that's that's the thing that a lot of these state-backed kind of ideas are so drab and dreary. But then again. This, I suppose, is where it comes from. It comes from the world of administration and the Stasi, the new Stasi we've been drawn into, the EU, which, ironically, the people who want to remain are accusing everybody else of not being diverse and not wanting multicultural things, where the whole idea of the EU is to destroy all that, to destroy uh, national sovereignty, but also national identity so no one will have an identity so everything's going to be bland so what you do first of all is you empower all of these groups um these minority groups often the minority groups that aren't even minorities that shouldn't even be groups and you get them fighting against everybody else you put your correct your politically correct narrative and that's where we are at the moment and it's pretty yeah. boring so yeah i've been looking at a lot of this coverage of the yellow vest thing and the live streams that are going on do actually tell a different picture to what the mainstream media are putting out you can only cut and paste and edit for a certain amount of time when there's live footage coming out um, even though 90 percent of the public don't see it it's very revealing if they do and that's what to me has become quite interesting about all this the fact that they haven't been able to quell it even though they've been using these draconian measures against the public now this to me is outrageous they're using firearms against the public and they're gassing them yeah, now yeah. We, we, we go on about oh a sad gassed his own people these stories were entirely made up and they're all of these stu- stupid people the the fake um Blairite left, whatever you want to call them, they're all up in arms about something that's happening thousands of miles away that isn't true. But when something's happening across the channel that is true, they don't even seem to want to get involved and say this is a breach of human rights. You know, this is what gets me about it all. Then you realise how controlled it really is. Well, if it was happening in Africa, um, they would be called for regime change. You know, but they're not calling for the regime change of Macron because he, of course, is a core driver in the European Union. And uh, the, the, he, his um, partial surrender to the Yellow Vest, of course, broke the European Union uh, budget restrictions. Um, uh, but they let him do that. Whereas when the Italian government produced a budget which broke the restrictions, they wouldn't let it happen. So, you know, there is complete double standards here. And it's worth noting that the the amount of money that uh, Macron has made available is about, um, I think it's uh, one, I don't know, one eighty or something. It's a tiny fraction of the amount of money that the European Central Bank has been printing uh, on an annual basis uh, just to prevent a certain type of economic crash. So, you know... Him, him talking about being generous is ridiculous. It's, it's just a bit of a sticking plaster to keep people quiet. And it seems like a lot of people in Europe are realising that, uh, especially in, in France. But the yellow vest is, is, is spreading. Um, I think an important thing to understand now is about the European Union, in that if the powers that be in Britain don't let a uh, Brexit happen, um, or it looks like they're trying to make it difficult. I think there's going to be more and more discussion about what is the actual nature of the European Union. Because although Gorbachev described it as some sort of copy of of the Soviet system, um, it's not exactly that. In, 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 it's 
sort of formally it looks a bit like that because it's an undemocratic dictatorship from the centre. But when they talk about redistribution of wealth, it's not redistribution downwards, which is happening in the European Union, it's redistribution upwards. Um, and uh, when the, uh, especially when you look at the climate change thing, which is central to the ideology holding it all together, um, the way money is spent on the uh, so-called saving the planet things is to hand out huge amounts of money to large, insane projects like damming the Amazon or huge amounts of wind farms. Is a very big project which result in the super rich and the big corporations gaining money. So that's where it's going. And in the last uh, five years, the richest 0.01% have been getting a lot richer and the rest of the people have been getting poorer. So that is the way that the European Union is taking us, an undemocratic theft on the back of uh, everybody. Uh, or almost everybody. So that that is going to become more realised in, in in the uh, um, months to come. And I would also like to mention stuff that we've been doing directly on the climate, but they are related. The 20th of December meeting was a great success in um, the John Harvard Library in Borough High Street, and there's uh, video versions of it on weatheraction.com. And there will be some more video versions uh, soon from uh, you, Mark, anyway. That's uh, right, yeah. That, yeah. It's definitely worth a, a visit, that. And a thing we pointed out there was the deepening crisis in the so-called climate science. I mean, there are now record amounts of ice in the world, and we've had more and more of these extreme cold blasts, which we warned of years ago, and are now happening. Uh, there's been very extreme cold blasts just happened in Eastern Europe and Russia. And this was explicitly in our long-range forecast. The very cold blasts we were expecting from Britain didn't happen in uh, December, although we did have some early taste of things in October. There were some small cold blasts in December, but there will be some bigger ones in August. So I would urge people to look out for that and come on the uh, weatheraction.com site and even buy some forecasts, which are now special offers, which are going to be ending on New Year's Day. OK, then, Piers. What are your predictions for next year, if any, or do you want to keep them under your hat? <laughs> next year's weather in general, you mean? Well, predictions well, uh, geopolitically and the weather. Oh, right. OK. Well, weather-wise worldwide there'll be more and more of these wild jet stream events which will be um big contrasts you know hot bits and cold bits generally more cold bits um well there'll be a pattern all over the world uh, especially in the temperate regions um that doesn't mean we have a hot summer it could mean there will be some hot blasts in um, very unlikely to be as hot as we had, thing we had it last year, um, this year rather, just gone um, in Britain. But uh, there will be those sort of hot blasts around the world. But generally speaking, it will be uh, on average a cooler summer causing um, crop failures. And basically, the what's just happened in, in summer in Britain was a kind of uh, one-off. <laughs> nice bit just before more and more bad bits so that's what I would say about um, weather and climate politically I think the European Union is heading for more and more trouble and um, probably Brexit will you know hasten the demise of the whole operation and uh, different countries will then uh, break off uh, I mean, I think Greece would have already broken off, but they're somehow obsessed with keeping in the Eurozone. Well, you know, I think they're going to have second thoughts. Um, Italy and Hungary are having serious second thoughts. Uh, and some other countries have got movements in them as well. There's even a French movement, a Brexit movement. Um, Ireland could well follow the United Kingdom and 
break off. There is an R exit um, movement uh, as we speak, um, and that that could happen. Now, the good thing about the break up of the European Union, of course, will be that um, uh, we'll have more sovereignty over what we do, and all these countries will. And things like the European diktats, which prevent progressive policies, such as preventing nationalisation of railways and so on, uh, those type of things would be uh, prevented by the European Union, which is uh, one very good reason why Labour and the and my brother's policies actually uh, only make sense if the European Union is is exited, or if the European Union were to agree a special case with Britain or sort of something like that, but that is something they're not willing to do. As you can see, when they force Greece, people in Greece to eat grass because they wouldn't agree uh, certain strictures, you see. So, you know, the, the best way forward for Britain in any progressive sense is out of the European Union. And anyone who's listening who hasn't yet signed that no deal petition, I urge you go online to do it. The, the link is on weatheraction.com, but it, you can find it very easily. Just type no deal Brexit petition in, into a computer and you, you, it'll come up. That's great, Piers. So exciting, yeah. exciting year, yes. Definitely, and if you want to book our talks, The Bigger Picture, please do. I'm going to actually play the promotional, if you can call it that. Yes outro to the bigger picture which will describe exactly what it's all about so hopefully we'll see you all at an event next year or we'll see you where we see you 9 p.m every sunday at windows on the world.net get in touch with your stories keep us updated and thanks for listening good night from me the bigger picture an amazing series of talks featuring piers corbin mark windows and sandy adams bringing you the most important information you've probably never heard. There is a bigger picture going on behind the repetitive mantras of change, regeneration, diversity, vibrant communities and sustainability. And they've gone through a plan which is the same on all of them. Countries weren't taking this on. They just weren't. It was too much trouble. And something happened at the Johannesburg Conference in 2002. The Corridor of Power and Control, decoded and explained. The point is a lot of these operatives don't know about the 2021. They just, oh, that's what that council did, and this is what the Association of London Authority says we ought to do, so let's do it. And they, the community, you just closed down uh, day centres, closed down playgroups, um, create traffic problems. OK. And, oh, destroy meeting places. Aylesbury Estate, the first thing they did once they decided to demolish was knock down the community centre in the middle. I mean, I used to belong to the Ecology Party years ago, and that was real environmentalism. This has been hijacked. It's a Trojan horse. They want to treble housing density and put flats for sale where not a single tenant on the flats in Danbury Avenue overlooking the park is allowed to re return to a flat in Danbury Avenue overlooking the park. Not one. Well, there you are. That's what the Club of Rome actually put in this report. It was their plan to, to make humanity have a common enemy. They thought global warming would fit the bill. Labour, Conservative, Green, Liberal, it doesn't really matter because none of them are going to address the main issue of what this is about because they can't, because it's above them. Did you know that in 2018, 64% of populations in so-called democracies state their governments rarely or never act in the public interest? Lie one, lie two. There you go. Lie one would be atheism. Lie two is organised religion. OK, so let's have the extreme left and the, the invented far right. UK think tank, Demos. The new democracy will work with a combination of government open infiltration and citizen groups taking direct action. Change agents, change agents breaking down, you know. Oh, 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 oh no, I've got to go on another course after this. Where there's a problem, there's a solution. Because it means that anyone who gets one of those forms does not have to sign it. And they've stopped it now, right? They've given them back to the council, so... That affected hundreds of thousands of people. What? If you engage with this stuff and learn a bit of it, it's remarkable what you can do. And I'm going to give you some more examples of that as we go along. 
global elite's aim is nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The system was to control in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert through frequent conferences and private meetings. Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope, 1966. To book our talks on the bigger picture, contact us at info at windowsontheworld.net. Join me, Mark Windows, for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Check out our archive and program stream at windowsontheworld.net. So, thank you very much for listening, everybody, to part two. Listen to part one of that show, The Final Revolution, question mark. And there's some extremely useful information in there. So, until next year, till next Sunday, 9 p.m., that's it from Windows on the World. So it's good night from me, and it's good night from Piers Corbyn. Yep, good night. Thank Have a good new year, and prepare for 2019. Absolutely. Well, we're all going to be there, aren't we? See you there, then. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody.